how does business, the third sector, NGOs and government and media and the public, how do we collaborate in order to tackle what is a pretty entrenched and systemic problem? And we all need to come together and we need to sort of have the attitude of how can we help each other in order to tackle these issues? And why do we want to do that? Because ultimately, I have to bring it back to an individual. And I have met too many victims of modern slavery to know that we don't have the option to say no. It's actually, we're going to say yes, and how are we going to do it really effectively and really swiftly so that millions of people, and it is millions of people around the globe, are lifted out of situations of slavery and trafficking and exploitation. Human trafficking doesn't always take the form we first imagine. It can be found at almost any level of an organization's supply chain. What can compliance professionals do to assess human trafficking risk, and how can they leverage the resources of the organizations they work for to help root out this tragic problem? Gwen Hassan is here to help. This is Hidden Traffic. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Hidden Traffic. This is Gwen Hassan, and I am thrilled today to have as my guest, Andrew Wallace, who is the CEO of Unseen UK. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Gwen, a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for asking me. You're welcome. So let's start out probably with the easiest part, which is, can you tell us a little bit about Unseen UK? What is the organization? Where are you based, and what's your purpose? So we are headquartered in Bristol in the United Kingdom, which is 120 miles due west of London. So for the American listeners, everywhere in England is not London. So it's it's, it's not London. We are about 15 years old and we do five main things. So we work with victims of human trafficking and modern slavery that are identified within the UK. We work with all the major statutory agencies. So police, our national crime agency, our border force joint working with them, intelligence sharing, victim care. We work with paramedics and local government, helping them have a better response and be more victim focused. We then work with many, many different businesses of all different sizes, shapes and hues, helping them tackle the issue of forced labor within their supply chains and how to comply with the increasing and the growing legislation around modern slavery and human trafficking. And then we run the UK's Modern Slavery Helpline. That's a helpline for victims to call, for members of the public to call with tip-offs, for businesses to call when they're facing these issues or they've come across the issues and they don't know what to do, for police to call. So it's open 24-7. And then we take, if you like, all of that frontline information and expertise, and we use that to work with governments around the world to help them devise better legislation and smarter policy. So that's what we do on a Monday. That's it? That's all? Boy. Yeah. yeah. We take, we take the rest of the week off. You're not at all ambitious. My gosh, that's a lot that you are covering. If I can seize on one thing that you raised that I'm particularly interested in, tell me more about the helpline. How is it manned? What kind of volume are you seeing? And are you making referrals then out to enforcement agencies or to you know, kind of police officers? Or how does that work? Sure. So we started the helpline back in 2016. It's a 24-7, 365 operation, so fully manned. We can get calls from victims that say, help, I'm in this situation. I'm truncating the process. Sure, yeah, often sure. from victims, that, that, yeah, there's a multitude of calls before they get to that place of confidence of saying, okay, I'm in this situation. It's about me, and I want to get out of that situation. In that circumstances, we would then work with the victim, whether you know, they want the police to come in or whether they can get a get bit of myth busting. You know, sometimes they're free to move and so that, you know, we can direct them to either an NGO or the relevant authorities or the police in order that they can then leave that place of exploitation. We get many calls from businesses going, help, I've got concerns, you know, either in my own business operations or within my supply chains. What do I do there? We get calls from police officers saying, I had some training about modern slavery and human trafficking five years ago. I've come across someone that I think is a victim. Can you remind me what I need to do? Mm. And then we get road calls like, can you pick up my kids from school? (laughs) Wow. I wouldn't have expected the last one. But So how do you manage 
those responses? Do you have a dedicated staff that only mans the helpline around the? Yeah. So it takes about six weeks worth of full-time training before you can even get onto the helpline and take a call. Primarily, we don't know from call to call what the call is going to be. We don't know whether we need to react in quick time or slow time. My helpline advocates need to know you know how the legislation works how the handoffs especially like with policing or if it's you know, sometimes it's an international element so it's our national crime agency or it's border force so we have lots of mous with lots of other agencies in place as well as ngos we can also signpost people if they want to access the government support system so signposting them into that but it's really critical that the helpline advocates and call handlers they understand all the legislation, that they're victim-focused, that they know where all the handoffs are. Everybody is an individual, and we have to ensure their confidentiality and their security and their safety in dealing with that. And then also we get calls from the public. You know, I've seen something, doesn't seem quite right. We want to get as much information out of them as we can in order that we can put that into an intelligence package that we can then share with the police and then action on it. You know, we had one case one call led to a police investigation that ultimately led to approximately 250 victims being found oh my god as a result of that so now that's one extreme of we see but when you have cases like that where you can go that call led to that that led to somebody getting free from situations of slavery and trafficking then it's kind of tick job done or if it then leads to our work with we have a business call and out of that relationship, we then are able to work with that business and help that business be much more ethical in terms of, and much more focused on, you know, where the vulnerabilities are. Then you go tick job done. So, yeah. How rewarding that must feel for you to be able to see really tangible results of the work you're doing in terms of literally changing people's lives. So bravo. How did you get involved in this work? What called you? to start working for this area? I came across the issue of trafficking actually through well, a colleague of mine that was on a business trip in the Ukraine. And he was there with a number of other people. And to cut a very long story short, he stopped, or they stopped rather more accurately, a woman being trafficked. She had responded to an advert in the papers and had come to this place thinking that she was you know, going to meet the person that was going to enable her to fly from Ukraine to the US. And then she was going to get a job in Central Park in New York selling ice cream, and she was going to earn $85,000. Oh, my this, goodness. Yeah, great job. I've applied, but they turned me down. <laughs> Thankfully, one of the members of the team was also a member of one of the human trafficking task forces in the US. So he went, mm. ah, something's not right here. And they ended up paying her back because she scraped together her life savings in order to get the flight ticket and everything else. So they paid her back and said, don't ever respond to these adverts. And just at that moment, her trafficker turned up. So they ended up having to buy her off a trafficker a second time. Oh my she goodness. left. And then a while later, the trafficker came back with the local cops because they were in on the trafficking racket. So they then all had to leave town pretty quickly because they didn't want to get into a situation that could have got rapidly out of control. So that story came back. It was kind of like Wild West and it piqued my interest. And it's a bit like, you know, when you buy a new car and you think, oh, I'm the only one that's bought this car, and then you realize every other person in the neighborhood's bought it, the exact <laughs> same car and the exact same color, that purple car syndrome. I just started seeing, it wasn't as frequent as that, but I started seeing stories in the press about trafficking. And then a friend of mine came back, again, also from the Ukraine, where she was a teacher. She had been working in the orphanages in her summers off. And she'd come across the issue of trial trafficking out of the orphanages. So she then told me this story and I went, okay, trafficking, trafficking. I wonder if it happens here. And then to really sort of complete the story, I saw a story about, and it was historical, but it was talking about trafficking from Eastern Europe to the US and how the traffickers used regional airports in the UK to avoid detection through the main hub airports to then fly people into the US. So they'd avoid the Frankfurts, the Heathrows, those major hubs and then obviously flying into the smaller airports in the US again, increased chances of getting people through. And where I live in Bristol, Bristol Airport was named within this article as one of the airports that was used. Mm. And so I just joined the dots and ended up doing what I thought was normal, which was writing to all of my members of parliament and members of the city council and the chief of police 
saying, I've come across this issue, I'm aware of this issue, what's going on? And to cut a very long story short, it led ultimately to a meeting with a really senior police officer who kind of lifted the lid off the city of Bristol and then off the UK in terms of trafficking is alive and well. And he and I had a sort of three to four hour off the record conversation. At the end of it, he said, look, any idiot can make a stink by writing a letter. And you've done that. You can retire happy. But he challenged me. He said, what are you actually going to do about it? And mm. I said, well, what do you need? And I really shouldn't have asked that question. Um, <laughs> and at that time, so this is like 2007, 2007, 2008, he said, well, I need safe houses. Because he was a police officer that was kicking in the doors and finding victims. Okay. He would stick them in a hotel on a B&B overnight, and they would just disappear overnight. And he knew they were going straight back to their traffickers to be re-exploited. And so he was frustrated both in terms of what was happening to victims, but also that he couldn't then talk with victims in order to get to the criminal networks okay. and try and dismantle them. So he said, that's what I need. And I stupidly said, oh, okay, I'll do that on one condition. You're my first trustee, because at this point, you know more about it than I do. And he agreed. We shook hands on it. So that was really sort of the genesis of, of Unseen. And then the lady that I was telling you about, she had enough of teaching and she said, oh, I'm looking for something to do. And I said, do you fancy opening a safe house? I have no idea what a safe house is or what it means. We've got no money, but should we give it a whirl? <laughs> and that whirl, you know, ultimately turned into Unseen. So really, you had an idea long before you knew how to make it happen and yeah. persevered through until you figured it out. Yeah, we had no funding or anything. I remember reaching out to some of the existing NGOs at that time and saying, look, come across this issue. I really want to do something about it. And it's different for everybody, but I think everybody has those issues where you go, that's just not right. And I've always been one of those people. And if it's not right, then I need to do something about it. I can't just whinge about it. So I've always had a sort of social justice core to, to what I do. But when I approached the existing charities, they were like, nah, we're not interested. So I kind of, all right, I've got to do this on my own. And then the view was, well, if you're here in five years' time, we'll talk to you. Mm. So we're here 15 years later, and we are all talking, and we're friends now. Excellent. And you know what? We're similar in that regard, which is why you're talking to me on this podcast, which is, I love that term whinge. I've been whinging about it for a while and decided, hey, what can I do to even make a small dent? And what's some way that I can move the ball forward, which is why I created the podcast, so that I could yeah. try and for lack of a better term, proselytize out there to everybody else, hey, this is a real issue and it's not something that you only see in movies. It's not a Liam Neeson movie. It is, in fact, something that occurs on a daily basis to millions of people around the world. And you, as a compliance professional, have a role in making sure that your corporation and your resources and your organization's team are trying to prevent it as well. Because so often the subcontractors are where this comes into play. So let's talk about that for a minute, if I can pivot. You mentioned that among all of the many services that you provide, you do consult with companies about kind of what they can do. If someone's just starting out in this space, let's say this podcast is the first they've really heard about human trafficking. Where do they, as a compliance professional, start? Would it be with a education kind of a a place of educating their management team? Do they do a risk assessment? Do they do both? Where should a company start? That's a great question. And I think depending on where you are in the world will sort of affect the answer. But what I'll do is I'll try and give our listeners kind of like, here are the basics that apply everywhere around that. And I think the first one is just, what is your attitude to this issue? Is it an attitude of, oh, well, you know, if it impacts us, then we'll do something about it. But I don't think it really is applicable to my business. Or is it an attitude of, all right, well, when this happens, it does affect our business. And I can tell you, there isn't a sector, there isn't an industry sector, and there isn't a country that isn't impacted by this issue. And I've been in boardrooms where I've had the board telling me, oh, this doesn't apply to us. It was a major bank. And I went, okay, so let's talk about where you invest. And let's talk about who does your catering, who does your cleaning, who does your security, who builds your buildings. So I think the first thing is admit the guilt. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, really. Yeah. Yeah. 
get over it. That's not the issue. The issue is, and I've stood in many a conference and said, look, the issue isn't me being here to make you feel guilty. We're all guilty. Let's get over it. How do we get out of the mess that we've built in, in that whole process? So it's when, not if thinking, and it's, okay. okay, I've got a problem. And then it's about how am I going to ensure that this issue is taken seriously throughout the business? Because it needs to be both bottom up and top down simultaneously. Okay. And then the third thing is, who am I going to work with to deal with this? And often the experts in the room are the NGOs and not businesses. Why are NGOs the experts in the room? Because probably they're the ones that have the closest contact with those who are the victims of this. And therefore, they understand the circumstances in which it takes place. I think the other thing to recognize is that certainly in the 15 years that I've been involved in this issue is that your opponent is super smart, super well-resourced, super agile, and will look at your business and go, where can I insert my commodity in order to make money? And I think what will help, I think, our listeners is when we talk about modern slavery and human trafficking, in essence, what are we talking about? And I define it like this, which is modern slavery is an illicit trade. It's a commodity trade. The commodity is a human being, mm. and they are bought, sold, and exploited in order to make vast profits. And so your trafficker, stroke, exploiter, you know, whatever we want to call them, will look at your business and go, where can I insert my commodity in order to get as much profit? And I think one of the changes we've seen in recent years is inserting people into legitimate businesses and what you don't see the exploitation. So you don't see the fact that they control their bank account, they control their movements to and from work, they control where they live and they extract they pick in their passports and their documents and yeah. And, and on and on. And probably all those things that, that are probably there in, in the public parlance. And if you're not sure, you can go to our website. We've got all the indicators there as well. So do that. So it's kind of like understand the lie of the land, understand that you've got to have a, a mindset, which is I've got a problem understand that you have to do this in collaboration with others and then become the champion for it within your business. And it's going to be, do everything from actually, are there systems and structures within our business that facilitate this? And what do I mean by that? So you need to go and have a conversation with procurement because how does procurement work? Procurement works on the basis of, I need to extract as much profit from this supply chain. And that's what I'm incentivized on. That's how I'm rewarded. What you don't see is if you put that pressure in at the top of the supply chain, as it works its way down the supply chain, it creates the environment for exploitation. It creates the environment for vulnerability. It creates what is sometimes referred to as a perverse incentive, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and so here's radical thought number one, which is how are we going to create a procurement model, which is around a social value metric? and around ensuring that there isn't exploitation within that. Mm. The other thing is, do you as a business even know where your supply chains are going? I think that is the key. So many do not. Yeah. yeah. If you don't know where they're going, you don't know where your vulnerabilities are. And you say, how are we vulnerable? Well, this is the way the media works. When they find something down in the supply chain you know, where there's a problem, they just follow it up. And they seem to be quite easy to follow it up to your business. <laughs> So I never buy the excuse of, oh, we can't map our supply chains. Yeah, you can. And, you know, it's funny when you talk to different sectors. So if you talk to the aerospace and the defense industry, they can map their supply chains to source. So I kind of figure it's not that hard to do. And so you've got to know where your risks are. Then you've got to know where you're subcontracting. Like I referred to that bank earlier, you know, who cleans, who caters, who's often those industries that are cash payments to the workers, um, but they're in your business you're doing business with them. I used to work in retail and we had a problem with our cleaning company. Thankfully, it wasn't labor exploitation, but there was subcontracting and subcontracting and subcontracting. Yeah. So it's very yeah. difficult to know the person that's coming in is the person that you thought you were contracting with uh, in all of that. Then you need to also be aware of the existing legislation in your jurisdiction and how you need to comply with that, but also where legislation is going as yeah. well. And I like to refer to it as a slow-moving tsunami, and it's a tsunami of both transparency and legislation. And so for any business, I say to them, look, you've got two choices with a slow-moving tsunami. You can learn to surf, or you can be wiped out. 
a simple choice. That's all you have with a tsunami. So it's kind of like, face it like that. And then this needs to be owned in the boardroom. There needs to be at least a nominated director that owns this. And then the final thing I would say is, and this is me sort of being the futurologist, is saying, look at what millennials and Generation Z are saying and doing and wanting. They do not want to work for a business that doesn't take these issues seriously. They will either leave your business in droves or they will not even approach your business. So as a business, if you want to say, well, where are we going to be in 20 years' time? It's kind of like, well, if, if we're not taking these issues seriously, then we will become irrelevant and we won't be able to staff our business and we won't have the brightest and the best. So I think there's lots of good reasons. And I haven't even talked about the moral issue of actually, do you want your business thriving on the backs of exploited human beings? Yeah, I think, so you've hit on so many things that I think are really important. Number one, you're right, this this kind of groundswell of movement towards social responsibility and ESG as a term, I think is now quickly approaching the place where it's a mandate, not only morally, but from a court of public opinion standpoint, and eventually from a regulatory standpoint. I know the the EU now has its new third-party diligence rules coming out soon. You know, there's SEC guidance that's come out about publicly listed companies in the United States being able to make representations about its own kind of social governance and social responsibility statements. I think it ties in nicely. I hesitate to use the word nice in connection with this with global climate change issues and the kind of mandate to make sure that people are responsible stewards of not only their shareholders' investments, but of the communities they do business in. And I think that human trafficking fits into that as well, because you're not being a very responsible steward if, to your point, you're making money off the backs of people that have been trafficked against their will to work for a contractor or a subcontractor or any one of the many that are in that supply chain. I think, though, the key for me and what you just said is that this is going to be a huge paradigm shift for companies because companies historically, as we both know, have been focused on a commodity as a thing, right? As a widget, as a service, as a something that they're delivering. And it's never occurred to most people that people are a commodity and that their labor is a commodity and is part of their supply chain. I'll also say, I know I've worked for multiple manufacturers over my career, and I repeatedly hear that the idea of mapping out the supply chain is too difficult. You know, there's too many parties. I worked for one company that had over 100,000 third parties that they knew of, but that was an estimate because they didn't actually know for sure how many third parties that they were doing business with. And I think to your point, that's the place you need to start. If you haven't mapped out your supply chain and figured out exactly who's subcontracting to who and where they are located and what the risk is, and as you said, where there's a place that your enemy can insert their commodity, meaning traffic labor, into your supply chain, you're missing the boat as you go along. I'm in complete agreement with you. I mean, I think the other thing is also, what are you going to do when you find it? Yeah. My strong encouragement, and again, this is back to transparency, is certainly in those jurisdictions where that there's now either a transparency in supply chains, you know, California, UK, Australia, Canada eventually, you know, the EU, come on, the US catch up. So I think you know, the more transparent you are, the safer it is to be. You know, one of the things that we're arguing for in the UK, because the UK government has said it's going to upgrade it's transparency and supply chain legislation, is that it is mandated that every business has to report the number of incidents of modern slavery it's found within its supply chains and business practices Mm. or explain why zero. Now, I think that's, if we can get that, that would be great. Because actually what it does is, you know, I talk with lots of business leaders, they go, well, if I say I found it and I've got a problem, you know, my shareholders are going to flee, my profits are going to nosedive. We've handheld some major global businesses to say, put it in. Trust me, it's not going to cause a problem. And it hasn't caused a problem because actually everybody knows that there's a problem. And it's kind of like by denying it, that's a fool's game. But by saying, look, we went, we looked, we found it. This is then what we did. This is the lessons we learned from it. This is how we made restitution and remediation 
as a result. And we're now applying those lessons back into the rest of the business. People go, yep, that's fine. What do shareholders do? Yep, that's fine. What do investors do? Great, because actually you're taking due diligence seriously then. You're being proactive, um, yeah, instead yeah, yeah. of reactive, yeah. Yeah, and so actually I think what we're seeing, and I think that you're right, that there's a huge transformation in terms of you know what investors want, what shareholders want, and we're seeing this with COP26, this, this whole move to sustainable profitability yeah. versus extractive profitability. I'd prefer to call it exploitative profitability. Mm, I like um, that phrase. Yeah. Let's call it what it is in that whole process. And we've seen the G7 come out saying, you know, we're going to have a real focus on forced labor within supply chains. And we'd like to see the Tariff Act, not just in the US, Canada and Mexico, but also in the EU and in other jurisdictions. So things are moving. So like, if you're listening to this as a you know, general compliance leader, it's like, how do I get ahead of all of this so that I'm protecting my company? Yeah. Which is, I kind of figured that was the job that you were meant to do. It's like, <laughs> how do you get out in front of it this? Is. Yeah. yeah. That, that is the goal of every compliance professional is to not be in a place where they're reactive and constantly putting out fires, but to be in a place where they can see what's coming down the pipeline and prepare the organization to make sure they're ahead of that curve. I mean, that's kind of the ideal here. And your organization, it seems to me, is doing a lot to help companies get there and on a broader scale to fight the problem overall. So bravo to you for doing that. Thank you. We're at time now. I don't want to run too long, but do you have any final thoughts for me in terms of what you think is coming next? I know you mentioned the possibility that the UK Act will add in kind of a disclosure requirement that would require specific numbers for the first time of how many cases you've found. Anything else you think is on the brink here coming up? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to sort of persuade the the UK government to do. I mean, it's also said it's going to bring in some much more punitive penalties for for non-compliance around that. But at the same time, and and I think it's always depressing to leave it on a sort of a punitive note. So let's leave it on a positive note. (laughs) Okay. And the way I leave it on a positive note is back to this issue of collaboration. How does business, the third sector, NGOs and government and media and the public, how do we collaborate in order to tackle what is a pretty entrenched and systemic problem. And we all need to come together and we need to sort of have the attitude of how can we help each other in order to tackle these issues? And why do we want to do that? Because ultimately I have to bring it back to an individual. And I have met too many victims of modern slavery to know that we don't have the option to say no. It's actually, we're going to say yes, and how are we going to do it really effectively and really swiftly so that millions of people and it is millions of people around the globe are lifted out of situations of slavery and trafficking and exploitation. Bravo. Amen to that. How can people find out more about Unseen UK? I know you mentioned your website. Could you tell us what that is? Yeah, so that's unseenuk.org. You can go there and you can go down as many rabbit warrens as you like. That uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. So you can hassle me there. I'm always posting stories on these issues to inform and to challenge and to encourage us to do more and to do better. Great. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with me today. I really appreciate it. Andrew, it's been a great conversation and I look forward to my listeners learning more about Unseen UK and I'm sure we'll hopefully maintain contact as we move forward. I'm going to mine your network for more people I should talk to here as well. So great talking with you, Gwen. Thank you.